Okay, folks, so we're back with the faithful ones again. And uh, we're going to have a look at the beasts from the depths of the sea. Someone said to me that this is what they're looking forward to, but they're not here to hear it. So I don't know how they expect to look forward to it. It's up to them. However, it's important that we do follow these two in the series, otherwise we're going to lose the connectors. And it's those who do who will get the crowns for So um, we're going to have a look now as we move into the prophetic section of God's Word. And remember, we've done the groundwork in the things that we've studied together. And uh, remember the tale of the two cities. Now don't forget these things because these are the connectors. The tale of two cities. Which two cities are we talking about? Babylon and Jerusalem. That's right. And uh, it also goes with the concept of the, or conquest, I mean, of the gods. Who are the two gods? Satan and the true God of heaven. You can say Jesus if you want, but he's part of the true Godhead, isn't he? But the two cities, Babylon representing the falsehood, uh, the, the, uh, those who belong to the kingdom of Satan. Uh, Jerusalem representing the kingdom of God, those who are true to the true God of heaven. And, uh, and then, of course, the two gods that we say, they fall into those two categories, Babylon or Jerusalem. So in the tale of the two cities, we are now moving into that area where the, uh, the conflict of the typologies that we saw in the historical section are going to become apparent in the spiritual conflict that is to take, well, has taken place, is taking place, and is to come to a climax at the end of time. So let's move on here. And uh, again, I've harped on about the true philosophy of history sufficient time that I'm going to remind us once again, and I make no apology, because this is foundational to what Daniel and Revelation are talking about. And that is that God is in control. Uh, it may be times when it appears God is not in control. I'm wondering, can we have the lights out, please? It might just help if we put the lights out. And then, uh, just... It doesn't help them at the back. Oh, doesn't it help them at the back? Do the ones at the front. Yes, that's fine. Can we take these out as well? Or would that take them back? Okay, so how do you need it to the back? You've got it lit up there. No, see the board. It would be helpful if you put out the mouth. We can see the board. But the, the, the true philosophy of history is that God is in control. And just to remind ourselves of this, Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God from age to age, for wisdom and power are his. Can you, can you see that? Oh, that's better. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Wisdom and power belong to God. And uh, he is the one who changes times and seasons, who deposes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells within. We read that this morning, didn't we? And uh, we need to be reminded of these things constantly. Again, Daniel said, we will tell the king its interpretation. Your king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, into whose hand he has given human beings wherever they live, and whom he has established as ruler over them all, you are the head of gold. So Daniel is making it very clear that the powers that function, the powers that be, are there because God has allowed it to be. And God is, is the one who can bring it to an end as well and replace them. All right? Now we've seen this over and over again. So the true philosophy of history, the most high rules, uh, men and nations have a probationary period, as we said this morning, and if they don't harmonize with the, with the will and the plan of God, then uh, that period will terminate in the judgment and finally in destruction. And it's evident by the eventual fall of Babylon and the successive kingdoms that also fell and we shall be reminded of again this afternoon. And so Nebuchadnezzar he was faced with this situation he had to make his choice and we rejoice that he finally did make the right choice and God restored him and, and blessed him 
far more than he had been blessed before, it says. And every one of us must also recognize that we are accountable to God. We will all be called before the judgment seat of Christ and we will face the outcome. And for the faithful, that outcome will be with Christ in his kingdom, won't it? Okay? And likewise, it's the case of the spiritual Babylon and Jerusalem as revealed in the book of Revelation. Now, we're looking at the, at the historical kingdoms today, but we're going to move on next week to the spiritual kingdoms, all right? So, the historical Babylon and Jerusalem, next week we'll move into the spiritual Babylon and Jerusalem, but we'll get that connection as we go through. Now, I want to say this in connection with the true philosophy of history. When Winston Churchill was a 16-year-old boy, he had a vision, I don't mean a vision like Daniel, he, he had the idea, the concept, you know, he saw his purpose in life. And uh, I, I, remember, I, I read about his, his life and I was quite interested in what he said because as a 16-year-old boy, he somehow had the concept from that young age, though he didn't know what was coming, he didn't know anything about the war that was coming, but he had this concept, and this is what he wrote, that this country will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion, and I shall be in command of the defences of London. It will fall to me to save the capital, to save the empire. Now, those of us who are older, I was born at the end of the war, so I don't remember the war, but, uh, but we know that Winston Churchill was a great statesman. In his earlier days, he was not respected in Parliament. No one thought he would ever make Prime Minister. He saw what Hitler was doing, and he warned them, and they wouldn't believe him. And finally, uh, I think he was head of the, of the Navy, I think, uh, at the time, and he was able to report in Parliament that Germany had overtaken Britain now in its armament. So they began to realize now that Churchill was right. So he ended up as Prime Minister. But he had that vision as a young boy that he would be leading Britain through to victory through some great invasion, some great attack. And we know that by Churchill's attitude and his uh, the, the way that he inspired the nation, he led them on to victory in the certain speeches that he made. Now, this is an interesting statement. Uh, you've heard of James Baker, who was the former White House Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Treasury under President Reagan, and then uh, also White House Chief of Staff and Secretary of State under President George Bush. This is what he said. Uh, he said, Churchill's entire life and destiny seemed to have been miraculous. Though not a religious man, he nevertheless had a sense of divine destiny. I'd add that Churchill did believe in God. He was often quoting the Bible as illustration. His very survival sometimes was nothing short of miraculous. Likewise, both Britain's survival during the horrid summer of the 1940 Blitz and the near impossible evacuation at Dunkirk have been characterized by some as miraculous. But were these marvellous outcomes the result of divine intervention? Such a question, says uh, Baker, raises the possibility of God's intervention in history and the interaction between the spiritual and material realms. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, obviously, he had this, this concept. You know, it's very irritating when this door keeps clicking. I wonder if we can get the people to come in and sit down. It might be helpful. Again, Carl Thomas, in his foreword to the book, God and Churchill, and he was a reporter and political communist, he says, does God have a plan in human history? Does God intervene in the course of human events? Does he raise up leaders at critical junctures to save civilization? If so, was Winston Churchill one of the many deliverers who have appeared in history's arena at just the right time and place? Now, looking at these statements, when we have read the philosophy of history as outlined there in the scriptures, and we've just been reminded again that this afternoon as well as this morning, we can, cannot help but agree with that question, uh, that 
the interventions, the miraculous things that have happened, because it is a miracle that this country did not succumb to the Nazi invasion. They intended walking up Whitehall and taking possession. It is a miracle. Their armaments weigh way above what we have. From a human perspective, we could have failed. But it seems as if God was in control. And this, to me, is a tremendous encouragement because in spite of what man seeks to do, it's like this Brexit issue that's on at the moment. And without getting political here, um, one wonders, are we going to come out as we voted? Or are the Remainers going to succeed with their little schemes? We don't know. But to be honest with you, Europe has never yet been united. And whether we stay in or come out, the prophecy of Daniel 2, I have no doubt, will still remain in its fulfillment. If God's word never fails, God says it will come to pass. There have been times when it seemed as though what God said would happen wasn't going to happen. But it has happened. The prophecy concerning ancient Tyre, uh, that it would be thrown into the sea, that Babylon would come and break down the city. Uh, it seemed as though that prophecy was going to fail. Nebuchadnezzar did come, and he did break down the city, a lot of it. But he was recalled back, and it, the people lived there. It was about two, three hundred years later, when Alexander the Great came, that the city ended up in the sea and it was never rebuilt. Uh, I've been there and they draped the nets where that ancient city used to be, just as the Bible said it would be. The modern Tyre is what was on the island where they fled, but ancient Tyre has never been rebuilt. God's word is always fulfilled, not when we think it will be, but when he knows the time is right. And so again, Wallace Henry, who was co-author of the book, and he was a journalist and Christian columnist, as well as a White House congressional aide. He says, the most important thing I did while working at the White House was to participate in a prayer breakfast every Thursday morning in the West Wing. Those gatherings brought me into contact with people who believe that God works through the events of history. I had never thought much about that, but I was intrigued. And when Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, he turns it wherever he will. Was it more than simply beautiful poetry? Does God raise up leaders and bring them down? As the prophet Daniel says, indeed, these men are obviously familiar with the Bible. But these statements are thought-provoking and direct us to what God says. Daniel said, blessed be the name of God from age to age, for wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. It's he who deposes kings and sets up kings. It's he who gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. It is he who reveals deep and hidden things, and it is he who knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. And so let's come to this prophecy in chapter 7 of Daniel, which is the first in the prophetic section. And this prophecy is dated to have taken place some 50 years after Daniel chapter 2. And uh, we know the prophecy of Daniel 2, how it relates to us. Um, Babylon, at this time when this prophecy was received, was soon to be overtaken by the Medes and Persians. Um, and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was no longer alive, he had died, he was now resting, we believe, as we would say in France. But Nabonidus was the king of Babylon at this time, and his son Belshazzar was the second ruler on the throne who was uh, occupying, because his father was more interested in expeditions and other things. So Babylon is about to be taken over, and uh, all expositors of note agree that Daniel 7 parallels Daniel chapter 2. Now I've stated to you before that Daniel 2 is a platform on which Daniel 7 and the succeeding prophecies are built. And therefore, in the second chapter of Daniel, we have a panoramic survey, a very brief survey of the kingdom of the world from Babylon right down through to the very end of time when God himself will set up his kingdom. 
But Daniel Seddon now invites deeper investigation into that panorama. And it is as though God is giving us the prophecy uh, as an outline, as a basis, uh, with the basic ideas. But then he comes back and he zooms in. And he is magnifying certain aspects and bringing out more detail along the line. So from a political viewpoint, we could say that Daniel 2's prophecy uh, stood. But Daniel 7 is more of heaven's viewpoint that's showing that God is in control. It opens the prophetic section of the book, as I've said. And uh, in the next chapter, chapter 8, the, the language actually changes from Aramaic to Hebrew. Now, there's a reason for that, and I'll tell you what that reason is later in the series. But chapter 1 to 6 are the historical sections, and as we said, chapter 7 to 12 compose the prophetic section. Now, chapters 1 to 7 were written in Aramaic, as I've just said, Chapters 8 to 12 are written in, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew language. And as I say, I'll give you the reason for that at a later time. It's not appropriate at the moment. I'm just giving you that information. But chapter 7 summarizes, in a sense, that which was presented before, and then it paves the way for the continual description of Antichrist. What do you mean by Antichrist? Anybody know? I'm not asking for an organisation in the name of a person. Anybody know what Antichrist means? Against Christ. Well, I can hear you calling out, but I can't make out what you're saying. I do Against Christ. Against Christ. Against Christ. Well, it is, but it, it literally means in place of, instead of. Anti, in the Greek, means opposite or instead of, in place of. And Christ, Christos. So in place of Christ. So anything or anyone yeah. that usurps yeah. the position of Christ is anti-Christ. Yeah. You see? So uh, the, 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 the presentation in Daniel 7 paves the way for the description of the Antichrist and then of Jesus Christ, the true Christ, himself in the subsequent chapters. And it will amaze you how Jesus comes on the scene so much in this section of the book. And so we're told here, in the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head, and as he lay in bed, and then he wrote down the dream. Now this reminds me of what John writes in the book of Revelation. He was given a vision, he was given a revelation, and he was told what he saw to write in a book, which is what he did. And we have that book called the book of Revelation. So Daniel did the same, that's the book we're studying. He had a dream and visions of his head, and then he wrote down the dream, and he says, I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. So now here, he's coming into the pictorial section of, of this vision. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I watched, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being. And a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. I'm going to read this through uh, if you read the whole prophecy here. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I saw in the vision by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them, to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots, and there were eyes like human eyes in this horn, and a mouth speaking arrogantly. And as I watched, thrones were set in place, and an angel one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. 
a stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. And a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words of the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And as I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being come, come in with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship one that shall never be destroyed. Now, Daniel 7 is in two sections. The first section is what we've just read, which is the description of what Daniel saw in vision. The second part of Daniel 7 <coughs> is what the angel explained to Daniel. Remember, the angel is always present with the prophet in the vision. He explained to Daniel what these things meant. All right? So we're going to get our answers from the scriptures and from history. Okay? So there we have what Daniel saw. So let's come back. These four great beasts that Daniel saw, first of all he saw a lion with eagle's wings. We've seen that before, haven't we, in this series. The lion with eagle's wings. Then he saw a bear that was lopsided and it got three ribs or tusks in his mouth. And that was succeeded by a four-headed leopard with wings, four wings of a fowl. Quite interesting creatures. How would you like to see those in a zoo? It'd be quite an attraction, wouldn't it, if they had creatures like that in the zoo? But they, they, at least they resemble something that we know of. Lion, bear, eagles, leopards, and so on. But then the fourth beast that came up was a nondescript beast, as I describe it, because it was different from the others. It had no resemblance to the others in any shape or form. You know, this great beast that had ten horns and great iron teeth. So... It, it, no wonder Daniel was sort of quite taken by what he saw here. And so it tells us there that as for me, Daniel, he says, when he's seen this, he says, my spirit was troubled within me and the visions of my head terrified me. Now he's beginning to have thoughts like Nebuchadnezzar had. He was rather disturbed, seriously disturbed by what God revealed to him. And he was terrified at these things. He says, I approached one of the attendants, that's one of the angels in the vision, and I asked him the truth concerning all this. And so he said that he would disclose the interpretation of the matter to me. He says, as for these four beasts, four kings, that kingdoms shall arise out of the earth. All right, so let's remember these, these points because this is the interpretation that's given to us. Remember these cartoons or these caricatures uh, that God is giving Daniel represent kingdoms, but we'll come back to what those kingdoms are, all right? Four different kingdoms represented by those four beasts. And uh, he goes on, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. Now, just remember what we read a few minutes ago as we read through that first half of the prophecy. The judgment was set and the ancient of days was sitting on his throne and then one like the Son of Man came before him, which is Jesus. This is not the second coming of Jesus. This is Jesus coming into the, into the pre-advent phase of judgment. And he says he receives his kingdom. Because when Jesus comes again, he's coming as King of Kings, King of Kingdoms, and Lord of Lords. Well, he can't come as King of Kings if he hasn't got his kingdom. So he's receiving his kingdom during the time of the judgment, okay? Now bear that in mind, and we'll explain that in more detail when we come to that later on. But uh, that's the picture. So these four beasts represent four kingdoms that are going to arrive on the earth, but God is the one who allows them to come into power and he's the one who allows them to be pushed out again. But at the end of time, the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to come and establish his kingdom. He's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And during the time of the judgment, that's what he's doing. He's receiving his kingdom. The subjects of his kingdom are the faithful ones, like you and me, all right? The faithful ones who belong to him. Now, let's just clarify the symbolism again. I know we did this in our initial introductory presentation the other week, but let's just do it again. Beasts, as we've known from the scriptures, represent kingdoms or empires. Uh, kingdoms are usually made up of a selection of smaller kingdoms and become known as empires, don't they? We once had a British empire. We don't have that any longer. I know Europe wants to have a United States of Europe as an empire. Well, I don't think that will happen because God said it won't. Water. Now this is only in prophetic symbolism. Don't apply these symbols to the historical records. That doesn't apply. But water in symbolism represents people and nations. And we know that because in Revelation 17, the angel told John that the waters that you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So we'll just begin to put these together. Now it refers to the great sea where these four beasts came up. The great sea was what they referred to as the Mediterranean Sea, okay? They didn't have big oceans around them. This is in the Middle East and the great sea would be the Mediterranean. And, uh, and so this is the kingdoms that are emerging out of the nations around the Mediterranean area. Does that make sense to you? All right, let's see. Winds, what do they represent? Well, winds represent warfare and strife and promotion and trouble. And uh, the example is in Jeremiah 49 here where God says he's bringing the wind upon Elam and these are going to be winds that scatter them and their enemies are going to come and they're going to seek their life and God will bring disaster upon them. He will bring the sword after them. So winds are symbolic of warfare and strife and, and trouble. And so as you begin to put the picture together, the horns that are in the beast, they are kingdoms within the empire, smaller kingdoms. As for the fourth beast, the angel said, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. That's this uh, nice one up here, this happy looking one. That, uh, something that would be nice to make a cuddly toy for the children, yes? Don't have any nightmares with that. That's just an artist's impression. But as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. And as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. And then he says another shall arise after them. All right, so looking at this again, you've got the four beasts, the lion with the eagle's wings, the bear with the, uh, standing on one side, and uh, it's got three ribs in its mouth, the four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl, and then this nondescript ferocious beast that is different from the others, the prophecy says, that have ten horns and great iron teeth. And the prophecy said that three of these horns would be uprooted to make way for another little horn that would arise, and that horn would be different from the others too. Well, we'll come back to that another time. Now, observe the sequence of events in this prophecy. You put the symbols together here, we've got the answers as to what the symbols represent, and the answers have come from the Bible, so no one can argue with that, can they? So let's observe the sequence of events in this prophecy. First of all, Daniel saw the great sea, which we refer to today as the Mediterranean Sea, and the four winds are blowing down on the Mediterranean area and stirring up the waters. And in the symbolism, it's the, the troubles and the warfare are stirring up the nations around the Mediterranean area. And as a result of that, four great kingdoms arise out of those nations, out of those people. And uh, the lion comes with its eagle's wings, and then that is succeeded by another kingdom represented by the bear, and the third, the leopard representing uh, the next kingdom, and then the fourth kingdom is this nondescript beast with ten horns and iron teeth. And three horns are uprooted to make room for the little one, and then the prophecy goes on to talk about the judgment taking place in heaven, and that nondescript beast then with the little horn is put to death, and then Christ receives his eternal kingdom, and that's when he comes to redeem his people. So, Daniel 2, as we said, is the platform. These are in parallel, and they're zooming in to what was shown in this panoramic prophecy, giving more detail 
concerning Babylon, concerning Persia, concerning Greece, and concerning Rome. It also goes on to give more detail concerning the divisions of Rome, which are represented there by the feet of iron and clay, and they parallel with the ten horns that we see here. We'll go into that this afternoon, okay? And then Daniel saw in chapter 2 the great stone coming out of heaven and striking that image at the feet that were made of clay, and that represents the coming of Christ's kingdom, which is also mentioned in the, in the prophecy we've read this evening. Following the judgment will come the kingdom of Christ. So you can see already some of the extra details that Daniel 7 puts in. The judgment is a detail that isn't even mentioned in chapter 2. And uh, with more detail about the little horn, that's more information. We can go on with several other bits of information that will come to light as we move along. So first of all then, the beast like a lion with eagle's wings was the first, was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then said Daniel, as I watched, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being and a human mind was given to it. Now we know from archaeological evidence and we also know from what the scriptures say in connection with the symbol of the lion and the eagle, the king of beasts and the king of birds was used by the prophet Jeremiah as symbols of Babylon. And when we go to ancient Babylon, we find the symbol of the lion with eagle's wings. I've shown that to you, and I'll show you again, just to remind you. But you notice this, this animal, uh, a lion is a ferocious thing, and so is an eagle. Uh, and, and, and the ferocity of, of Babylon and its cruelty, you know, it was somewhat macabre. Uh, we've learned by the fiery furnace, and Zedekiah wrote in the fire, and what they did, Zedekiah, the last king, I don't know if it was the same king, uh, and uh, his witnesses, son being, sons being killed, and then they put out his eye and put him in chains and marched him to Babylon. A very cruel and vicious way of treating people, wasn't it? That those ancients were very cruel indeed. And then, of course, Babylon eventually settled down, warfare sort of finished, and uh, it was more of a life of ease. Hence, the wings being plucked off. It settled down, given the heart of a man standing on its feet, it became more humane in its manner and its activity. So Babylon, in parallel with the platform of Daniel 2, represents Babylon by the head of gold and the lion with the eagle's wings. And 605 was the year that Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel captive to Babylon with his three friends and others from the nobility of Jerusalem. That was the first captivity. And Babylon lasted till 539 B.C. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, just to remind you, the famous Ishtar Gate, we looked at in the walls of Babylon, and there were the tiles, and also the basalt lion of Babylon that was unearthed, and as far as I know, it still stands today. I took that picture, was standing when I was there, that was in the, in the 70s, 1970s, but you can see the lion very clearly here with the eagle's wings, the symbol of Babylon. God knew what he was doing, didn't he? He knew what he was doing. And here you can see this map with the outline of the Babylonian Empire. There's the Mediterranean, the Great Sea, and you've got these nations around, Egypt in the south, and this is Palestine here, <coughs> excuse me, there was Tyus that was put into the sea, but Babylon was in the land known as Mesopotamia, which is this stretch here where I'm indicating on the screen. Mesopotamia, Potamos is the word for river. So Mesopotamia is the land between the rivers, namely the Euphrates which is here, and the river Tigris, and they join together in the Persian Gulf. Okay, so this is the extent of the Babylonian Empire in this region here. <coughs> but then the lion's eagle's wings were taken off, and it was made to stand on its feet as a man. So the glory of ancient Babylon that was brought about through conquest, through warfare, and through victories, and the might, and the power, and the ferocity of the of the Chaldean army, uh, eventually settled down where they could enjoy their luxury 
in more sort of restful times of more peaceful times. And uh, ships used to come in and do their trade right into the city uh, as they sailed through the, the walls of Babylon. And uh, there we are. But then Babylon fell, didn't it? And we have the record of that fall in scripture. Daniel actually records it. We looked at that and we mentioned it time or two. Belshazzar was on the throne. And do you remember what it says? He took the sacred vessels from the temple. There have been about two and a half thousand vessels. And they were having these great feasts that the ancients did. They used to have these feasts for thousands of people. Uh, and uh, they took these sacred vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had looted from the temple in his invasions. And uh, these vessels that were sacred to God, they had been consecrated to God's service. And he brought them in and he filled them with intoxicating liquor, and he and his lords and everybody here was imbibing this stuff, and they were getting drunk, and what were they doing? It says they were mocking the God of heaven. Because we've got the, con the, the conquest here of the gods. You know, our God is stronger than their God because our God destroyed his temple, he destroyed his city, we've overpowered them, they're captive, so we, we are stronger than their God. And our gods are better than theirs. And then something happened. There was a sudden hush that came over the hall as this fiery finger started to write on the wall. And they were troubled, they were disturbed. And you can imagine Belshazzar going pale and his knees would knock together and uh, maybe he dropped his cup and who knows? It was a fearful sight to see a mysterious hand writing these fiery letters on the walls. Bidi, Bidi, Kiki, and he could be passing. And no one could understand and interpret it. And finally Daniel was brought in. And he said that from his presence, the hand was sent, that's from the presence of God, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Bidi, Bidi, Kiki, and passing. This is the interpretation of the matter, said Daniel to Belshazzar. Meaning God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tico, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And that very night, which night? That very night, and we know what night it was. I'll give you the date in a minute. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So, it's very interesting in the British Museum, there's uh, a clay tablet known as the Nabonidus Chronicle. Now, who was Nabonidus? He was Belshazzar's father. Nabonidus was the first king of Babylon. He was ruling now after Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Nebuchadnezzar was dead, Nabonidus was on the throne, and he was more interested, as we said, in the arts and in explorations and expeditions. He wasn't interested in battles and in, in warfare. This was now the time that Babylon was like the lion with its wings plucked off, standing on its feet, and with a man's heart given to it. So he put his son, Belshazzar, on the throne. But this chronicle of Nabonidus, which is now found in the British Museum, confirms to us the actual date of the event when this took place. It was on the eve of what he calls the Great Days of Celebration, which was the 16th of Tishri in their calendar, which was an annual festival that took place in Babylon. And in our dating, that would be October 13, 539 BC. That is a date that is established from this uh, archaeological evidence. It's an undisputed date. So we know that Babylon did fall, and we know that it fell to the Medes and the Persians in fulfillment of what God not only told Daniel in the first year of Belshazzar's reign, but also what God told Nebuchadnezzar back there in those early days, and also what God told the prophet Isaiah some 200 years before. I, I went through this with you earlier on, do you remember? Where Isaiah prophesied what would happen, that the gates would not be shut, and they would march the troops up the riverbed into the city. 
And that, is, in fact, God even named the one who did it, Tyrus. All right? Tyrus. Uh, and, um, or Cyrus, my big pardon. The other name was Cyrus. He named him. And Cyrus was the Persian ruler. But he placed Darius on the throne in Babylon at that time. Cyrus came to the throne later, but he put Darius the meat because the Medes and the Persians were working together. The Medes were in the descendancy and the Persians were in the ascendancy. So later on, he became known as the Persian Empire. But initially, it was the Medo-Persian Empire. And so that's how God's word stands confirmed before us, doesn't it? Now then, we have just the artist's impression here, but what happened? While they were feasting there in that hall and Daniel was interpreting to them, he says, this night your kingdom is given to the Medes and Persians. And that night they came in. Probably while they were feasting, the guards were coming in through the unprotected open sluice gates up the, into the city, taking possession of the city, throwing everything, and then they would burst into the banqueting hall and no doubt there'd be bloodshed in there and Darius, uh, not Darius, Belshazzar was slain and Darius was placed on the throne. And so the kingdom fell to the Medes and the Persians. And that is represented by this bear he, Because Daniel says, after the lion beast of Babylon, another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. He was raised up on one side, indicating the, you know, the ascendancy of the, of the Persians, uh, as opposed to the Medes. And it had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth and was told to rise and devour many bodies. In other words, its empire would be increased uh, as more destruction took place and more captivity took place. So Medo-Persia followed the empire of Babylon that fell in 539 and it continued for some 200 years until the third kingdom arose. And now I told you last week that just as gold was common to Babylon, silver was common to the Persians. And uh, you can go to the British Museum today and you can see the Persian silver. These are pictures that I took in the British Museum a number of years ago. The armlets here that would be worn and the cups and the plates and the ornaments and their gods and all the different exhibits. These are just a few of the beautiful silverware and, and, and objects that the Persians had. So God knew what he was doing when he used the symbol of the gold for Babylon and the silver for Persia, didn't he? And he's using these very meaningfully here. And the bear that was the three ribs on its side, the bear representing the Persian Empire, those three ribs, what do they represent? Well, the Bible doesn't actually tell us. So we can't be dogmatic on that, but commentators usually agree that it may maybe represents the three major conquests in order for Medo-Persia to come, uh, you know, as a ruling empire. And those conquests were Babylon, as we mentioned, Lydia, and Egypt. It was also down in the south. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not an important point. Um, it doesn't change the prophecy, whichever where you interpret those three tasks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so this map shows you the extent of the Persian Empire. It's greater now. The Babylonian Empire was this sort of territory around here. Now the Persian Empire is coming around right here. Uh, this is today is known as Iran, which is part of the Persian area. Susa, which is also known as Shushan in the Book of Daniel, and Ekbatana. Persepolis, these are important places in the ancient place at the Persian Empire's extent. It's all leading towards the eastern direction, you notice, of the Mediterranean Sea. And then the third empire that rose, this is after this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this four-headed beast represented the third kingdom that would arise. And uh, what kingdom was that? Well, we know that from history, without the Bible telling us even, that the empire that succeeded Persia was 
Greece. And it's represented by brass, isn't it, or bronze in Daniel 2. Now Homer, the famous historian, he refers to the Greeks as the brass clad Greeks. So brass was very common, or bronze maybe uh, was, was the language that was used. But this leopard was a, a very fast beast, it was a, again a ferocious beast, and the four winds of a fowl no doubt suggest um, the speed and the agility uh, in which uh, the, the Greek Empire took over, and that was very true. So you can see the brass here of the Daniel 2 image, and the four-headed leopard, uh, and the four wings representing the speed and the agility. Now you might say, well, why the four heads? Well, we'll come to that in just a moment. But Alexander the Great, as he later became known, was the founder of the Greek Empire. Now, he was a Macedonian, uh, which was this this section here. This section here was Macedon. Today it's Greece, but Greece is more than just that. So it was that sort of section around there that was Macedonian. His father, Philip, was the Macedonian ruler. After him, his son succeeded to the throne, and he uh, took charge, sorted out some of the internal problems, united his country together, and then he set out to conquer the then known world. And he marched his troops right up here to the Hindu River on the borders of northern India and Pakistan. And he would have gone further had they not refused to go. But a leopard is known for its swiftness. And in contrast to Babylon, two pairs of wings Babylon had indicates a speed here at least twice as fast in its conquest as that of Babylon with the lion with the eagle's wings. And um, <coughs> in 336 BC, Alexander came to the throne of Macedonia, and uh, this was just a semi-Greek state at the time. And as I've just explained to you, he subdued the troubles in Greece and Thrace. Thrace is, is what we've known as Turkey today, and he restored order in his own kingdom. And then he set out to conquer the Persian Empire. So in 334 BC, he crossed the Hellespont into Persian territory with only 35,000 troops. Now you might say that's not many, and it isn't compared with the sort of number of forces that they had in those days. Uh, in, in, in the, you know, you read the story uh, of the Jewish people, and sometimes they were faced with far more than 35,000 troops. They had hundreds of thousands. And so he, he set out with these well-trained troops in 334 BC. His first victory was at Granicus, and then his second was at Issus. We've just seen the notice impression of that in 334, the following year. And then the year after, in 332, he conquered Tyre. That's when he threw the city into the sea, as I told you about. And uh, then he came down and he conquered Palestine, and then he entered into Egypt unopposed. There was no fighting there. In fact, he founded the city of Alexandria, the support city today in Egypt. He was named after him and his troops hailed him. He, he declared himself a successor to the Pharaoh of Egypt, obviously, and so his troops now hailed him as a god because the Pharaohs were looked upon as gods and uh, united with the sun god in their death. Then headed out from Mesopotamia, that's the land between the rivers that I showed you, and on to the heart of the Persian Empire. And he defeated the Persians at the Battle of Arbella, and he was only 25 years of age when he did it. What an accomplishment for a young man with just 35,000 soldiers. And in 327 BC, he invaded northwest India. But once he crossed over the Indus River, his troops refused to go any further. They'd been away for home, from home for so long, that's far enough, they said. And without his troops, he couldn't go any further. And so he returned to Mesopotamia, and he made his capital in Babylon. It was after him that the city of Babylon itself was later destroyed, because Seleucus, who took charge of Babylon, he took a lot of the old buildings that were destroyed and built his new city of Seleucia. We'll come to Seleucus. As he returned to Macedonia, 
uh, and he made his capital in Babylon, and he intended settling there, but in 313 BC he died of malaria. Probably swamp fever, would be malaria, something. Uh, he, he was not helped uh, after that uh, period. He was probably an alcoholic, and he was drunken, and he died at the age of 33. It said of Alexander the Great that he was a man who conquered the world, but failed to conquer himself. But his conquests were like lightning, illustrated by the four wings of the fowl. He set out in 334 BC, as I've told you, with 35,000 troops, and it took him just 10 years to conquer the most massive empire known at that time. And he was unified both the East and the West, and later universalized the Greek language. In this way, he paved the way for the writing of the New Testament, because the New Testament was written in, in Greek. In Greek, point of Greek, and it was a, a universal language, and therefore it was good to have that in order to record the Gospels, the life of Christ, and the early church, and the letters of the apostles. So, Alexander, though he was pagan, God somehow utilized him in preparing the way for Christ. And so, when he died, they were left without a leader. Now, you notice the forehead of the letter. This is where those four heads now come into focus. When he died, they were left without a leader, and there was rivalry between the four generals of Alexander's army, which resulted in them striving amongst themselves for supremacy. And uh, the battle amongst his generals was fought at Ipsus in Phrygia in the year 301 BC and they, they decided to divide the empire between themselves. And uh, so we mentioned Seleucus just a few moments ago. He received Asia from Phrygia right across to India. So he went and he destroyed Babylon and he built his new city called Seleucia. Then there was Lysimachus who got the western part of Asia Minor and what we call Turkey today as threats. And Ptolemy, or oh, you know the Ptolemaics were down in, in Egypt, the days of Cleopatra, all right? And then Cassander, who was already the governor of Macedon, that was the, where Alexander originated from, he was recognized as the sovereign over them. So the map here, just a crude map, and it showed you, there's Macedonia, Cassander's kingdom, and Lysimachus took this section, Seleucus took this wider section out here, and there's the Ptolemies down here in the south round Egypt, okay? <clears throat> so, what came after the fourth beast was this nondescript beast. Now, whereas the others were empires that were destroyed or overpowered by the others, you can't say that Greece fell in that way because the empire of Greece collapsed after Alexander's death and it was divided up, as we said. But then, in the western side, the Romans were growing. Their empire was beginning to stride out. It wasn't an empire, but it was beginning to stride out and become an empire. And so, Daniel says, After this I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. Well, as any schoolboy will tell you, uh, that the empire that followed Greece was Rome. And Gibbons, the famous historian of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, he refers to Rome as the iron monarchy of Rome. And of course, God used the iron in the legs, didn't he, to represent the Roman Empire. So the parallel runs across there. Okay? Now, what happens then? Well, the prophecy of Rome is being fulfilled here, that the Roman Empire began to take sway. It was the Romans that were in power when Jesus was born. Remember Caesar Augustus? He ordered a census, and uh, therefore Joseph had to go down with Mary to Bethlehem to register for the kingdom. And Jesus was born under Roman rule. He lived under Roman rule. The Romans were hated by the Jews. The zealots were there. They wanted to overthrow them. And Jesus was finally condemned 
by the Romans. Pilate was a Roman governor and he was crucified by the Romans. And so the Romans were in power at that time and after Jesus the Romans continued because in AD 70 they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. In fact they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And the ones that were not killed in that under that war of the Jews, many of them were crucified back to back around the city walls. Uh, but those who remained were marched in chains to Rome and they were made to build the Colosseum. And I understood it took them eight years. They must have been worked to death. To, and if they did survive, they would die in the arena. It was terrible. And then, of course, there was not only the persecution of Rome toward the Jews, but also to the Christians as well, because those early Christians suffered under Diocletian and, and, and these Roman emperors. Uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, he was accused of setting fire to Rome. And so he was eventually captured, maybe on his way back from, from Spain, and he was accused of treason, and uh, the Christians were being blamed so that Nero could have his new Rome that he wanted. And the Roman power was a ferocious power. The, the Romans came over here to Britain, you can go and see that I used to live virtually on Adrian's Wall. I was north of Newcastle where we lived, and Adrian's Wall would come out in that end, right across the north of Britain. And there were Roman temples, and there was a Roman temple down the south at Walbrook and so on. We have evidence of Roman occupation here. They were a cruel empire, and they, they ruled with a hard hand, a, a rod of iron, as it says. And uh, here you can see the extent of the empire. It took in this whole area, and right up here, off the map here, and this inset, even here in Britain, as you just mentioned, right across the Romans' rule. But the prophecies now begin to zoom in in this main central section coming up here as well. It's as far, I'm going off the screen to show that it's indicating Britain up there. It, it takes in the west because that's where the focus is coming, that all focuses in on the activities around the people of God. Okay? Uh, so that will come up in our future programs. So Rome, represented there by the elect of iron, also represented by this nondescript beast, but it had ten horns. Not only iron teeth, but ten horns. And just as there were ten toes in the feet of iron and clay, so this had ten horns. And what do those ten toes and those ten horns represent? Well, the Bible says it represents the kingdoms. And we know that later on during the days of the Roman Empire the Empire began to break up because it was weakened through its immorality and its high taxation, its cruelty and all the things that took place and there were Aryan tribes oops, today, let me move in here there were Aryan tribes that moved in from the northeast of this place here and they all travelled down into the western part of the Roman Empire. Not the eastern part, the western part. And thus the western part of the empire was divided up into ten divisions. And these ten divisions, most of them, form what are the basic nations of Europe of today. And uh, we're the Anglo-Saxons here in Britain. Well, we're, we're more cosmopolitan today than we used to be. But uh, that's where the, the English and the uh, and the Scots and the Irish came from. The Franks in France, Alamanna in Germany, then you've got the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Eli, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Swedes, and the Vandals. Now, the Vandals were not called Vandals because they vandalised, but they did vandalise. They went around smashing everything up. And that's why today we refer to such people of a destructive attitude as the Vandals. They were named after the tribe of the Vandals. But uh, that's another story. But that's, that's a prophecy. The empire was divided into ten smaller kingdoms. And then it tells us uh, that the Roman Empire, I'm just reading here, the Roman Empire inherited the genes of the previous empires of Babylon, Persia, and Greece. In other words, the various elements of the pagan concepts and practices that existed in those former empires and the cultures that they practiced and the architecture even of their earlier kingdoms 
have filtered their way through the periods of history and been absorbed into the Roman Empire. And similarly, the typologies that we have noted previously in the historical section of Daniel chapters 1 to 6 have continued throughout successive periods of history. And God's people have faced the trials of opposition and persecution. And the Bible says they will continue to do so until Christ intervenes through the final judgment when he will come again. And so, friends, the ferocity of this fourth beast of Daniel 7 is so pertinent to these last days that the book of Revelation portrays this same beast compounded with the previous beast of Daniel 7 but presented in reverse order, indicating that this beast has absorbed the heritage of Babylon, the heritage of Medo-Persia, and the heritage of Greece. And in this way, it is pictured as the most terrible of beasts. And here we read of it in Revelation chapter 13, that John says in vision, I saw beasts rising out of the sea, having ten horns. How many horns? Ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, and on its head were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and the dragon, who was the dragon? Satan, gave it its power, and its throne, and great authority. Notice the blasphemous names on its head. Satan is the one giving it power, and its voice, and its authority. Who wanted to be God? Satan. Here we have the conflict going on between the gods. Satan wanted to be God. And so you can see this same typology being fulfilled here in Revelation. And it's going back to what we're looking at tonight. Built on the prophecy of Daniel. So then, as Daniel watched, he says, I was considering the horn. When another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them, to make room for it, three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. And so it says, in that little horn there were eyes like human eyes in this horn, speaking arrogantly. So there's something different about this little horn that these other horns did not have. This little horn had eyes like a man and a mouth speaking arrogant things against God. The others didn't have that. There was something about this horn that was, as it were, I wouldn't say supreme, but greater in uh, what it was doing and what it represented. But it had some human aspect in it, and it was speaking arrogant things. But in order to make room for it, three of those ten Ten divisions that we mentioned, those other horns, had to be plucked up by the roots. In other words, genocide had to take place to make room for this little horn to come into power. And that little horn is a very interesting power uh, that we're going to have a look at uh, next time. But he said, Daniel says, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me. And the visions of my head terrified me. He says, I desire to know the truth concerning the fourth beast. You see, that fourth beast attracted Daniel's attention more than the others. Because when we look at the picture now, from hindsight, we can see why. Because that fourth beast comes into the focus for us here in these last days. And he was also concerned about the ten horns that were on his head, and concerning the other horn, that little one, which came up to make room for three of them were plucked out. Those three were the Harulai, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And the one that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly and that seemed greater than the others. And then Daniel says, And now I look, this horn made war with the Holy Ones. That's with God's people. And was prevailing over them until the Ancient One came. And then he says, The judgment was given. Remember, the judgment follows the little horn. For the Holy Ones of the Most High, when the time arrived, when the Holy Ones gained possession excuse me, of the kingdom. And so, dear friends, you can see why Daniel was very troubled and concerned, because this fourth beast, and particularly the little horn, had a lot to do with persecuting God's people and with opposing God. 
and is a thing that we shall discover in our future trouble. So the appearing of that little horn gave great concern for Daniel, and it should be concern for us too. Friends, we, we should be interested in studying these prophecies so that we know what is happening and why, so that we know what is coming, and so that we can have a clearer understanding of the book of Revelation as well in our future events. So we need God's guidance, and we need to be humble enough to hear and to take the Lord what God is saying to us. And that is a prophecy for next time. So may God help us. And next week we're going to have a look at how we're going to identify that little horn, and then we're going to have a look in the afternoon at the, uh, what's called the Battle of the Beasts, another very important prophecy.